Life in Alaska doesn't come without challenges. These past few weeks have brought us several rounds of fresh, wet, heavy snow. When things don't go as planned with our equipment, we're left scrambling to deal with this unusually warm weather. Lesson of the day, always expect the unexpected. Good morning. We are shoveling out a path to our outhouse. It has been a crazy week around here. Woke up to a lot of snow this morning. We've had snow kind of back to back this last week around here. And unfortunately we were down our plow on our side by side and our snow blower. So me and Eric were in quite the predicament how to get rid of our snow for a little while. This snow we've been getting is really wet, heavy snow. It's not very typical for Alaska. Usually we have a lot of fluffy snow around here, but the temperatures have been so warm these last few weeks and it's just been holding pretty constant. You may have seen not too long ago, we had a major melt where most of our snow melted away, but now we have pretty much regained it all back. So we have a lot of stuff to do. It's all ready for you. Wind drifts. Yeah, they were bad. It was so windy last night. Some spots we only have like two inches of snow, so that's no problem. But then the wind blew these big mounds where in some spots we have, we got some that are like three feet. So wet snow, we definitely got to get it off the shelter logic. It's just, it's a mess today. We've been kind of out and about the past few days. We got the snow machines on the trailer still. We are out on the river, the frozen river. We were watching a snow machine race, which is pretty awesome. So those are out of the little cover over on the Connex, but we're gonna head over there because it's not looking good. In the four winters we have been here, we haven't really had snow drifts, the wind blowing like that. And it was like just whipping around last night and it blew snow all in here. So the boats back there, all the stuff we didn't want snow to get on now is covered with snow. So we're gonna probably do something about that. But I think the worst part is over here, the snow has been shedding off these roofs and it's been falling between the chicken fencing and the structure, which has been fine. It's kind of messing up the chicken fencing. But now with this wet, heavy snow, this one especially is gonna land on the fencing and I'm pretty sure we're gonna ruin our fencing. So we're gonna to have to deal with that when it melts. But enough looking around, we're gonna to get to work. And we got our work cut out for us today as usual. tell now why our snow blower had some troubles last week this snow is so awful for it this thing is a champ i mean it is a champ it can go in over two feet of snow it's not doing a great demonstration of that today but it normally can this snow is just something entirely different it just gets in those blades and they can't they can't spin like they usually do so it's really hard to remove the snow i'm actually really surprised i don't have bigger biceps because of this type of work I'm gonna keep snow on.
Chickens are totally full throttle right now. These warm temperatures have made a difference in their life too. Normally they start laying in February, but this year they started back in January and we are getting well over a dozen a day now. Because it's been so warm, I also had to clean out the chicken coop a little bit earlier than I normally do. And that's because all winter when things are frozen in here, I just keep adding straw and shavings and things like that in it. it kind of starts to break down a little bit, but it predominantly stays frozen. And then in the spring, I'll come through and chip it out and move it over to our compost. But just the other day, it was already really wet and moist in here. So I, I took the liberty, me and Eric, of removing it all and hauling it over to the compost pile. Well, holy smokes, there is snow underneath the chicken coop too. I'm not really sure how that happened. It looks like the squirrel's been the only brave enough one to venture out here. He lives out here actually, so I don't know what I mean by that. But I wanted to point out our chicken net is just totally comatose. We kind of knew it this year was gonna happen because we didn't string it. We should have really taken more of a priority to string it up tighter in the summer and we didn't. And now it's the same level of the snow. And I come in here and I try to get it off, but it's just a nightmare. And then if you saw the wall from earlier, that's gonna fall on it as well. So we have that to look forward to. Well, I think today actually went better than I thought it was gonna go. The players did awesome. Loving that new plow on there. We broke the plow mount, kind of ripped it off the front of the players the other day. We couldn't find one at any of the stores. Luckily we found one used, was able to modify it, get it to fit on there. I did catch one of the plow wings on a big pile of snow and it kind of bent it off. So I had to weld that up, fix that, but she's doing good. A few little things we got left to do today and tomorrow we got more work to do. This is one of the berms that is encapsulating our property. Eric did a really good job on the plow today. We actually prefer to use the snowblower a lot, especially like in the intricate areas, but that's because it blows the snow or throws it away from the property or somewhere else on the property and away from our space that we want to remain snow free. But with this snow, the snowblower just wasn't that helpful and we had to really resort to using our plow. And I have to head in to get the snow off of the trees again. Going in. Nice and solid, good job. Look at that. Walk right in. Man. I can't tell where their branches are. I gotta kinda go from, okay. I gotta go from the back. Say goodnight to me, cause I'm gonna be here for a while. Mm -hmm. 
All right, well, yesterday was a really hard day and we decided that we were going to make fresh donuts this morning. We have some donuts here filled with berries. We've got blueberries and raspberries in there. We're gonna head outside and eat breakfast. Oh my gosh. Do you want the board or anything? I'm gonna sit here and relax for a second because it's been... You wanna use a cutting board? Huh? This is a snow nut. Snow nut? Snow. Snow nut. Snow I'll just call it a donut. <laughs> snow nuts and coffee. You want some coffee? Uh huh. You dunking? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, look at that. Look at yours. Whoa. Oh my gosh. Cheers to Bell. This is mel melting faster than like uh, spring thaw. You know what I mean? I it doesn't even melt as fast usually. I can't believe how warm it is right now. And how quickly it's melting. These warm temperatures we've been having, I'm pretty sure spring is on the way. So I'm getting ready. We're touching up the chainsaws in here today. We're gonna sharpen them up. We're gonna put some bar oil in them, fill them up with gas, make sure they're ready next time we need them. We have two saws. We have this one, which I call the big saw. This is a Husqvarna XP 550 with a 20 inch bar. When this thing's running good, which it usually is, it cuts amazing, but every once in a while, this thing gives me some troubles. Our other saw, which I've had for about eight years now, is a $200, Echo, and it's a CS400. That only has a 40cc motor, so it's a lot smaller than this one. It's only got an 18 inch bar. It doesn't cut nearly as good, nearly as fast, but that saw has never let me down. It always starts. Okay, the Husqvarna, she's ready to rip. I'm gonna finish up on the little Echo and then we're gonna continue on to more sharpening. A lot of people don't know on these ice augers, you don't have to go buy new blades when they just get dull. You can just sharpen them up pretty much how you would a knife. So we got four bolts and these pop off and we're gonna get them sharpened up. Okay, it doesn't take much. Noticed a couple times ago when we were out, this blade was getting pretty dull and it was hard to break through that ice, so it should make a huge difference for us. When you're putting these blades back on, they do have to go a certain way, so take note of how you take them off. We have gone ice fishing after I'd sharpened these and I put them on backwards and they do not cut through the ice at all. So luckily I was able to get them flipped around with my Leatherman. Try something new. We like saving money where we can. And we've been using quite a bit of these little propane cylinders. We use them here for our torch, but we use them a lot when we go out to our other cabin, mostly for the lantern. And we'll go through a couple of these on a trip. And last time we were at Fred Meyers, these are $25 for a four pack of these. And what these are are just little one pound, they call them disposable propane canisters. And I bought a little mechanism here, got it on Amazon. I think it was only about eight bucks and you can refill these off of a big propane container. So we're going to give it a shot and see if we can fill a couple of these up. I believe it's cross back thread. Yeah, there we go. Okay. okay you put it on and then you got to flip it upside down because the gas is in the bottom of this and you need it to go into here. I read a tip you can use when you're doing this is you want to put your little canisters in the freezer before you fill these up. But these have been outside, so 
It's about 35 degrees right now. Let's see if it works. I can hear it going in there. All right, there it goes. I don't think I had this screwed on far enough. Oh, you can really hear it now, transferring the propane in there. There we go. I think we got her filled up now. Let's see. Awesome. Got a full little propane canister. This is gonna come in pretty handy. Let's get this one up. Well, I haven't done the math on it, but this is a 20 pound tank and costs like 15 bucks to fill up up here. So this thing is probably already paid for itself in one use. Cool. The Honda generator. We've had troubles with this thing pretty much since we have got it. It's a few months old. This is like their newest model. It's the 2200. We've done a few different modifications to it to get it to run good for us in the extreme cold. We did the crankcase breather heater on it. So it's got a little heater on there. I always put seafoam in it. Even though I did those things, we always changed the oil in it. When it was getting really cold, we were still getting freezing inside the carburetor. We were getting moisture inside this thing and it's so cold that it just freezes up and it was actually shutting off this generator. We pretty much have figured it out and got this thing to run good for us. And the main problem is water in our fuel. You get a lot of water in your fuel up here in Alaska, especially in the winter time. So I bought this little funnel and I think it's called a Mr. Funnel. I could be wrong, but it's a water fuel separator. The way it works is pretty amazing. It lets the fuel through gas, diesel, kerosene, heating oil, but it will keep the water in here. This is a cup of water and I'll show you how it works. It's pretty crazy. Not even a drop of water. You can see the water's in there. Not even a drop of water comes out of this thing. It's pretty neat. So we'll pour that out, shake the water out of it. And this is it's kind of a pain because you got to use a funnel, but this is how I've been filling up the little Honda every time now. and. It's making a huge difference on how this thing runs. So there's a little area at the bottom of the funnel and that's kind of where your water is gonna be left if there's water in your fuel. And then you'll just kind of dump that out. And then the good fuel will go through the funnel. If your fuel has no water in it, you are gonna, you're kind of gonna waste a little bit of fuel. There's like a little uh, groove at the bottom of this funnel where it will sit. That's kind of where the water would go if there was any water in there. So what I'll do is I'll take that fuel and I'll put it in something that can pretty much run on any fuel. Like our snow blower will run on anything and the snow machines are pretty good. So if there's a little bit left in here, which there is now, I'll go top off those machines. But the Honda's ready to run and charge the house up for us. Well, we're out on the frozen river. A lot of other folks out here too. It's a pretty big deal today. Uh, the Iron Dog snow machine race is coming through and that's what we're out here doing. We're gonna watch them. It's about 10.25 and we are not sure when we are going to see the first team cross by. We're at a confluence where rivers connect. One river goes into another, but clearly it's winter so they are frozen and it is a Alaskan highway. That's how we got out here. Conditions today are, they're just okay. In fact, they're actually pretty bad. It's warm which is nice for our skin, but very bad for river conditions. There was a lot of overflow on our way in and it was, it, there's flat light. So flat light is when you can't see anything and everything's white. You can't really see like texture in the snow to know how fast you should be going to avoid bumps. And then we were having some freezing fog on our windshield. And by windshield, I mean our goggles. Quick and easy. We were in the mood for apple cider. So we got little apple cider packets waiting on the racers. Any minute now, should be flying by. And they built a big jump right there. 
this year. I don't know if they're gonna go over it or if they're gonna go around it, but we're hoping they go over it. Should be pretty cool. So what we're looking for is riders with numbers. They have orange numbers on their windshield and they usually have orange helmets, I believe. We went to this race in 2019. It was awesome. It is so much fun to watch them. I think there's 28 teams today. I think it was supposed to be 29, but I think today, this morning I saw it's, it's 28 teams and they are released at two minute intervals. So once we see the first team, we should be rolling pretty quickly and start seeing the other ones. So the machines that these folks are riding are just like the best of the best. They're just these souped up snow machines. So they should be pretty loud and fast. I think they go like over a hundred miles an hour. It's crazy. The river we're on right now, uh, we're about 16 miles or 17 miles from where we parked our truck. And this is the same river uh, that we used to go to our cabin. So I think we're about a third of the way to the cabin, but we're not going to the cabin today. We're just going to watch the race. All the other guys were jumping it and I was like, oh, they got nice new machines. And then this guy comes on the super old one. So there's no excuses out here. <laughs> So the little one gets stuck and he immediately tries to get unstuck and then the other fella comes along and flies off. I just think that that's so ambitious that he tried to get his own self unstuck. Well quite a few more people have joined us and it's been like a good 90 minutes since they took off or what I believe is when they took off. I know that they're going to come through though because there's a lot of other people here also waiting on them. A little bit of history about this race. It is called the Iron Dog. I believe it got that name because of the machines themselves, the snow machines. You may be familiar with the Iditarod, which is famous and historic, and they actually go along most of the same trail. This race is much, much longer though. They do 2,600 miles is what they're doing this year, a little bit over that, which is impeccable. They do it in eight days. They go all the way out to the coast, to Nome, and to Cotes View, and then they come back around and finish off where they started. It's about an average of 300 miles a day, or over that, so pretty extreme, and it is known as the toughest, longest race in the world, not just Alaska. We were able to get service and we are tracking them now. There is a little feature on their website where you can track the racers. It looks like they're on their way. I'm not sure why why it took this long. I don't know if maybe they took off a little bit later than anticipated, but Eventually, they should be coming right through here. So perhaps it wasn't a good idea to go in the middle. We were way over there in the side because the way I learned, you don't really want to be next to racers, but everyone here in Alaska is a little different. And apparently you just run in the racetrack. I don't know about you, but that's a little close for comfort. Those are them, the fastest guys out here. We were, <laughs> we were way too close. We moved back. I'm pretty sure the guy's ski almost hit me. So we're back at a little safer distance now. We're quite a ways away from where they actually started. And when they start, they send them out every two minutes. And these are teams. So each team has two riders. And as they get to further out, you know, they get a little more spread out. So sometimes they're really close to each other. Sometimes they're a little spread out. So when we watch 
watch them the a few years back we got to see them at the takeoff they're going a lot slower obviously now they're really cooking i don't even know how many teams have passed us they're they're just coming real fast clearly and it's interesting to see i know it is brutal i don't know i'm not the one racing but i imagine it is extremely brutal and they're all just like hanging on for dear life going over these bumps. There's a lot of bumps on the river late season and this has just not been a very good year, I think, snow-wise. We had a really good freeze up in the fall, but there hasn't been that much snow and this snow that we have today is like concrete. It's just like wet, heavy snow. On the website, there's a cool little Q&A section and one of the questions is what are the most common breakdowns? And it says that suspension problems is usually something they encounter. I know we've heard about them breaking parts and having to get you know, having to repair them actually during the race on some of the downtime. And fuel is another big thing because they are using clearly a lot of fuel. So sometimes there has actually been machines that light on fire, which is really unfortunate. And I don't know if anyone's ever run out of a fuel, but I imagine that it's happened. Well, I don't think the jump is gonna be part of the show. There was one guy that hit it. I think he did a no footer, it was pretty cool. But that jump, you can't see what's on the other side of it. And they're actually going so fast that if they did hit that jump going that fast, they're gonna overshoot it way far. So they're gonna to have to slow down if they wanna go over it. And it's like a maze out here. There's people all over the place. So these riders are kind of just weaving through people and they're taking off. It's, it's pretty amazing how fast these guys are able to go in these conditions out here. It's just crazy. This race is not on a closed course, so there's other people out here too. There's some folks coming right here. They're hauling some freight. Looks like maybe they're going out to their cabin or something. So that's just another thing that these riders got to watch out for. Just normal people. I forgot to mention that if this wasn't already neat enough, I guess it's kind of obvious, but they are going on, like I said, the historic Iditarod route. So it is remote Alaska. They pass through quite a few villages, which is really neat. That type of land and those towns or villages are inaccessible unless you are on a snow machine, some sort of tracked machine or, you know, bush plane. So they actually have bush planes helping them that, I don't know what things they fly them, but I do know they fly out there to where they're going to bring them resources. So a little fact about the racers, they are required to pack a tent or a bivy sack, five pounds of tools, a first aid kit. They must also have a studded track on their snow machine and an extreme cold rated sleeping bag. And it has become popular for racers to vacuum pack their sleeping bags into little bricks to save space. And as far as fuel, they just use regular fuel. They don't use race fuel or anything like that. And the trail says on their website that the beginning portion of the trail is groomed, but that's a very short section. The rest of the trail is not groomed. And sometimes it says there is no trail and they just follow their GPS and that's how they know where they're going. Well, the bird is the word, and we've heard there's one team left. Otherwise, I'd really have no idea. I wasn't keeping count. This has been really fun, though. And I know that Eric and I have a nice warm meal planned right after the race. Well, not finishes, but goes by. That's it. Time to party. <laughs> Breakfast tacos. 
It's gonna be easy. Errol pre-cooked our potatoes and the eggs are pre-scrambled from the ride out here. It was a bumpy ride. Got some tortillas we pre-made at home, heating those up real quick, and we're gonna to top these tacos with green salsa. Breakfast taco. Thank you. Oh, that looks good. That is good, nice and warm. Okay, that was good, we needed some fuel. Another reason we wanted to come out here is, like I mentioned, this is the way to our cabin and we wanted to check river conditions and they're looking pretty bad. We hit a lot of overflow, which is water up on top of the ice. And I mean, deep, deep water we were having to go through on the way here. It's not that big of a deal if you're just riding snow machines. I'm pretty sure Errol and I Actually, I guarantee it we could make it to our cabin right now. But when we start towing a lot of weight or we start towing the dog trailer and the temperatures are even gonna get warmer, which is gonna cause even more problems. So unless we get some colder temperatures, we do not know if we will make it out to the cabin again this year, which is sad. Well, that was a really fun thing to watch. I'm really glad we came out here. There's a lot of other folks out here doing some cool tricks. So Eric and I are just watching them, but we have to gear up and head back. Maybe you'll take the jump? No? No. No, okay. <laughs>